Um, so today I am talking to you from my home, but I normally work at Monarch Watch at the University of Kansas. Um, so a lot of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you today is going to be information um, about the Monarch butterfly globally. But if I sh share any information about flowers or anything like that, it's, it's going to be focused on the upper Midwest region um, in Kansas and Missouri. So there might be some people who need resources from other places. Um, those those kinds of resources can be found at places like Pollinator Partnership for um, different ideas about um, what kinds of flowers to plant. So Pollinator Partnership is a great resource for that. I'm going to go ahead and start my slides and I have to share my screen with you. Here we go. Okay, so As I said, Monarch Watch is at the University of Kansas. Um, Dr. Taylor started Monarch Watch and he is the uh, d d director of Monarch Watch as well. Um, we have many events in this area throughout the year. Um, as you can see, uh, our spring open house has been moved to an, a, a plant sale that will be um, for online orders and pickup at Foley Hall. Unfortunately, we don't, don't have the details of that yet um, established, but we are growing plants for that. So we need to make sure that we find homes for those plants. We also have annually a fall open house and a fall tagging event. And I'll be talking to you a little bit more about our tagging program. And that tagging event is at the Baker Wetlands, uh, which is the south end of Lawrence, Kansas. There are tagging events throughout the country as well. Um, we, um, we sell the tags to people east of the Rocky Mountains. So if you find a tagging event in your area, um, those tags came from Monarch Watch. Uh, Dr. Taylor um, established Monarch Watch in 1992, and he assumed the role of running the Eastern Tagging Program, which had be begun many, many years prior to um, Monarch Watch's establishment. Um, there are other volunteer opportunities throughout the year at Monarch Watch, and I just wanted to show you some pictures of some of our, our volunteers. We have a family of people who work with us um, since the age of toddlers. They've grown up basically with us, and we really appreciate their help. But you can see here, here they're doing lots of different types of activities, stuffing envelopes, helping us with our plants, um, helping with us with our live animals in, in at Monarch Watch. Um, we also have data entry opportunities for people who might be able to work remotely. Um, as I mentioned, there was a tagging program that began way before Monarch Watch uh, is it, it was uh, conceived. It began in 1940 with Dr. Fred Urquhart. Um, and it wasn't until 1975 that the first tag that was applied to a monarch butterfly was found in, the, in that following um, January in 1976. It was found by Dr. Urquhart when he was being followed by a National Geographic magazine film crew. Um, this is from the magazine. The cover of the magazine is a photograph of a woman sitting on a, a tree stump cover in the the entire forest is covered in um, monarch butterflies. It's an iconic image. You can Google it. It's pretty amazing. Um, Dr. Taylor decided that we needed to know more about monarchs other than just where they're coming from. So he, uh, he continued the tagging program and also made the tag system a little bit more um, uh, safe for the monarchs as well. And here you can see one of our participants releasing a, a monarch butterfly. And you could see um, on that butterfly's wing, you can see a white mark. That is the tag that's on that butterfly. People of all ages can participate in this program. Um, we generally try to keep little toddlers who don't have a lot of, of um, muscle control from handling butterflies. But those kids who can follow instructions, um, they, it, monarchs are super sturdy. They have to fly very, very long distances, and they're not built like a lot of the other butterflies and moths that you see in our landscape. They're, they're um, 
scales that are on their wings are very, very securely attached to their wings. And so you won't get that dust like you get with a lot of moths and other butterflies. Um, they're also just um, very, very sturdy butterflies. They're built very well. What we're looking at here is a map of the migration of the monarch butterfly. And we have two main routes that the butterflies take. Um, you can see west of the Rockies, there's an entirely different route. Um, Monarch Watch does not focus so much on the, the Western population. Um, our main focus has been the Eastern population, uh, the majority of which those, those butterflies end up in Mexico and the overwintering grounds in the fall. Uh, as you may have heard, it's a four step or five step process for them to get all the way up from Mexico to wherever they end up in the summer. There, by steps, I mean generations. So the great, great, great grandchildren of the um, overwintering monarchs end up flying back to Mexico the next year. Um, that means there are generations removed from having been there ever before. So that's one of the miraculous and um, unusual things about this migration is we have butterflies that are flying long, long distances, up to 2,500 miles at sometimes, all the way down to those overwintering sites in Mexico. Um, here's an example of one of our tagged butterflies that was found in Mexico and photographed. Um, a lot of the tags that are returned to us are from butterflies that are found dead on the forest floor, but with the advent of digital photography, it's been really great for us to be able to receive a lot of reports from butterflies that are found alive and photographed and those tags are not recovered, but they are um, very, very interesting records of, of butterflies that are still alive. So um, that means that they'll be able to re-migrate potentially back up to uh, the United States and, and start the new population over again. This one traveled, it looks like 1,620 miles from Ontario, Canada, all the way down to um, an area north of the overwintering grounds. It hadn't quite made it there yet. This is what the butterflies look like in the Oyamel forest in Mexico during their overwintering time. And this photograph was taken by Dr. Lincoln Brower, who um, is uh, since passed, but he, um, he was for a long time an advocate for the forest in Mexico, as well as monarch butterfly research. Um, he would uh, fly over the forests in an airplane and take photographs and use those photographs to estimate population size. That is how we get these graphs that you probably have seen before. If you've followed monarch butterfly population size in Mexico, those graphs are based on those estimates of, of the amount of space that is covered by monarch butterflies in the winter. So we are not talking about population density here. We're talking about the amount of area covered by monarchs. And so, as you might imagine, that can lead to some questions about how many monarchs are actually there. It's really difficult to get an accurate representation. When Monarch Watch um, employees talk about the population sizes, we usually try to stick to the number of acres or hectares that are being covered, rather than trying to extrapolate an actual number of butterflies. So as you can see, there's been a steady decline. Um, unfortunately, the earliest records that we have are from 1994, and we do not have those aerial photographs to look at from prior to that time. That's not really a long history of collecting data. So a little bit about monarchs. Monarchs are obligatory milkweed consumers when they are caterpillars. That means they can't eat anything but milkweed. Females will um, smell around for these milkweed plants and touch the plants with their feet and they can taste with their feet. That's how they know what plants to lay their eggs on. This was a, a plant that was, uh, has, as you can see, many eggs laid on it. This particular spring was a very warm spring. The monarchs came up pretty early and started laying their eggs on plants that had barely uh, started to emerge from the ground. Monarchs uh, build up the toxicity of the milkweed plants throughout their life. 
and that benefits them. When it comes to predators, a lot of butterfly species have this adaptation where they eat plants that are toxic. That would include, say, the, um, the pipe vine swallowtail, the pipe vine plant is toxic, and the pipe vine swallowtail um, also is a toxic insect when it is consumed by other um, predators. So a lot of butterflies have adapted to mimic monarchs and pipe vine swallowtails, as a matter of fact. So you might have heard of the viceroy. The viceroy is a mimic, mimic of the monarch. So what happens when a bird eats um, a monarch butterfly? And this is an iconic image that was taken by Dr. Lincoln Brower, who also took the prior images uh, that you saw of the overwintering forests. Um, he was doing research on what you know what happens when a monarch eats a butter a, a, sorry a bird eats a monarch butterfly well this is what happens it vomits um, the cardiac glycosides and other po poisons in the milkweed plants cause an immediate reaction in the animals and this used to be an image that you would see in a lot of textbooks throughout the united states biology books um, it's easy to find on the internet uh, for those of you who are educators who might want to find this one, um, that bird just threw up and it is not interested in eating a monarch butterfly again because it has an association between the bright orange and black coloration of the monarch butterfly and what has happened to it after it ate the butterfly. Monarchs, um, when they are in the overwintering grounds in Mexico, are considered to be non-reproductive. That helps them to conserve energy, which is um, another reason why they've traveled all that way to Mexico. They go to Mexico actually not to enjoy the summer sun, the, the winter sun and, and bake, bask in the sun. They actually are going there to thermoregulate, to temperature. The temperatures of the forests are just perfect for them and it keeps their body temperature just above freezing uh, and allows them to slow their met metabolic rates down. Monarchs can't survive below freezing. And um, when they are in the uh, breeding se season in the summer, they are reproductive and their lifespan is much shorter. So they only live two to six weeks when they are reproductive versus that long overwintering lifespan of six to eight months. Remember, these are completely different butterflies. The ones that are reproductive that live in the summer are, um, there are different butterflies that, than the ones that are uh, not triggered to become reproductive and instead migrate south. Monarchs need a lot of nectar. We talk a lot about milkweed and how important it is for monarchs to have that. Well, that's just because that's the kind of the nursery of the monarch butterfly. But in order for them to, maintain healthy adult populations, they have to have lots of nectar. And one of the things we like to encourage people to do is to grow native nectar sources. So for example, this New England aster that you see here is also the host plant of the Pearl Crescent. And um, we like to encourage people to investigate different types of plants that they're growing and see what might be eating them. Uh, and to put up with a little bit more herbivory in their garden than, than, than they might normally have um, in the past. Some of the really good resources for monarch citizen science are found on the Monarch Joint Venture website. This is just um, one example here that I'm showing on my page of a flyer that Monarch Joint Venture produces and it is about monarch citizen science. They also have them about gardening, um, milkweeds, uh, raising monarchs. They have a wide variety. So if you're writing stuff down right now, definitely write down monarchjointventure.org. Um, Journey North is a, an organization that tracks the migration of not just the monarch, but a lot of other, or other organisms, such as hummingbirds and whales. Um, and migratory birds. Um, and so you can participate in that in more than just monarch research. They're also a great place for us to go when we need to know where the monarchs are right now. So if you go to journeynorth.org and you click on their monarch maps, you can see where people are reporting monarchs today. Um, 
Monarch Watch has a calendar, pro calendar project. So if you're interested in just looking for monarchs on a regular basis, um, a lot of people who are retired are participating in this because they have a little bit more time to watch on a daily basis. Um, the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project, Monarch, uh, Project Monarch Health, and the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program are also things that you might look into if you're interested in doing citizen science. Monarch Watch has uh, launched, 15 years ago, we launched the Monarch Way Station Program. And in that time, uh, the first 10 years, we had about 10,000 way stations, but then uh, because the monarch population has declined so much, we actually more than doubled that in the next five years. So um, right now we are at about 27,500 monarch way stations throughout the United States. And I'll talk a little bit more about that if I have time. Um, but it is a garden certification program for those who have the resources in their gardens for um, monarch butterfly populations. And this is the Monarch Way Station at the University of Kansas. It's the first in the country. And um, we are open uh, seven days a week. And even now you can come on campus and as long as you're gathering in, in groups of uh, fewer than 10 people, then we, we can uh, let you come and look at the garden. So in our area, um, we have a group of milkweeds that are pretty popular for monarch butterflies, and we would encourage people to plant these. Um, as you can see, a lot of different uh, things like the nectar source of the common milkweed. This is Asclepias syriaca, or common milkweed. Um, it tends to be a little bit more of a pushy, uh, underground root system is just really aggressive on this plant. So we um, encourage people to plant this if there are hopes to, they're hoping to not have a super well-tamed milkweed in their, in their garden. Asclepias incarnata is swamp milkweed and swamp milkweed has um, less of an aggressive root system and it also can tolerate a little bit more water. And this is a very common prairie um, flower here, this Asclepias tuberosa, which is butterfly weed. Um, and butterfly weed uh, is, has been said not to attract as many egg-laying females, but it sure is a great nectar source for a lot of things. And, and, egg, and eggs do get laid on it if it's the only option available. And then we also have other species that um, people may not think of in this area. I'm just going to let you look at those and maybe write some down. But the one that I want to talk about uh, is in the lower left corner there, which is often called vining milkweed or uh, sand vine. It is, as you may notice, is not an Asclepius. And it is one that monarchs do lay their eggs on and come to all the way up to becoming an adult, uh, fu fully functioning adult. Um, this is one that we oftentimes see monarchs laying their eggs on in the fall um, because it's really the only milkweed related species that's available um, at that time. All the other ones have gone underground. Milkweeds in this area are perennial and they uh, will go um, dormant in the winter time. So why are monarchs declining? Well, the number one reason for any decline in a population has almost always been uh, some kind of habitat loss. And it's usually caused by human, uh, human, human uh, land use. So we have a lot of the, the prairie that was originally in the upper Midwest part of the United States and all the way down into Texas, as you can see, is gone. And that started at, you know, when, when people started to plow the prairie up because it was really good agricultural soil. And since then, the fragments have gotten smaller and smaller. We have in Kansas, um, as you can see, some of the best tall grass prairie ecosystem but it is getting uh, smaller and smaller every year. 
And a lot of that tall, gra tall grass prairie that we have is extensively managed for cattle rather than for prairie. So um, that is an issue. We also have, um, we, we're more and more marginalizing the land that monarchs have available to them. Um, and we also see degradation of overwintering habitats in Mexico. So that picture that we saw before of the overwintering ground that Dr. Lincoln Brower took, here's another one from another location and you can see going right up to the edge of the forest, uh, we have some long-standing deforested areas. And that gray, that sorry, that um, area that looks rusty orange, that is all monarch butterflies that you can see there roosting in the trees. So what happens here is that um, we lose a lot of the buffer that the trees are allowing for those microclimates that those monarchs are looking for so that they can stay that perfect temperature aren't as easy to um, keep in check because the um, the wind and rain and all the other elements can get to the trees a little bit more easily with the forest being um, degraded. Another thing that uh, we talk about is the use of um, glyphosate tolerant corn and soybeans. Now um, at Monarch Watch we're not anti-farmer but we do recognize that glyphosate tolerant corn, corn and soybeans have had an imp impact on Monarch butterflies and I really put this slide up just so that we can see how what our role in that is. Um, if you're a meat eater you might consider that 97% of the soybeans that are produced in the United States, actually it's 80, it's 97% of the 80%, which is a little confusing, but that, that large amount of um, soy is going to animal feed. And then an all, a large amount is also going to biodiesel and other ind industrial uses, but very small percentage of this is going to food. Um, this is what a soybean field would have looked like prior to the use of glyphosate um, tolerant cro crops. And it turns out that the, the um, milkweeds that are in those croplands are actually very productive when it comes to monarch uh, caterpillars. So, and there have been, there were studies that were done before the advent of, of about 90% of all crops that are soy crops now are um, glyphosate tolerant. And so before that large amount of crops were tolerant to glyphosate, uh, this is what the soybean fields would have looked like. And you, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but way back in the background there, you can also see some more milkweeds that are popping up in the field. This is not ideal for, um, for soybean farmers to have that kind of milkweed. They want to have um, no competition with, with their soybeans. Also with corn, this is the this is a typical snapshot of what um, corn is being used for. Most of that is being used for livestock feed or ethanol, and and the ethanol is going into our automobiles. So glyphosate, which I've spoken about, but I haven't really explained, it doesn't kill the monarchs directly, but it's a herbicide that um, is placed on the plants and it kills the milkweed plants. So um, those of you who want to go into the science of that, it actually suppresses the essential plant enzymes that allow them to grow at the correct rate. So that's how it works. It's not actually directly killing monarch butterflies. So I want to make sure that uh, that's understood. And this is kind of a shocking representation of the difference between our glyphosate use in 1992 versus 2016. <clears throat> Another issue with monarchs is climate change. Um, unfavorable breeding conditions, unfavorable migration weather, and unfavorable overwintering weather, which we spoke about being exacerbated by uh, the defest deforestation. Those are all issues that affect monarch butterflies, obviously. 
but they also affect everything else that is sensitive to those things along the path of the monarch, monarch butterfly, which as you know, is an extens extensive pathway. So it goes all the way from Canada to Mexico. And in between there are all kinds of insects and other populations that are being affected by these changes in our environment. What is the number one cause of global, global emissions here in this? We have energy use as number one. And then second is agriculture. And the third is transportation. And we're also using agriculture to fuel energy use and transportation. So you and I have a role to play in this by de decreasing some of the things that we do on a daily basis to increase these numbers. What kinds of foods are we eating? What kinds of transportation are we using? How much energy are we using on a daily basis? Think about maybe reducing that for the monarch and you'll actually be helping more than just the monarch. Dr. Chip Taylor is often looking at these wind maps. This is a, um, a, a snapshot of what the earth was looking like on this particular day uh, as far as what the wind was doing. If the wind isn't favorable because of um, ocean currents and other things that are happening on the planet, the monarch can't necessarily fly where it needs to go. So what is Monarch Watch doing? Monarch Watch has started a Bring, the ba Bring Back the Monarchs campaign. And since 2013, we've distributed over 750,000 milkweed plants. Um, we have growers in Kansas, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, California, and Florida. Part of the issue that we're having right now is that some of our funding has been uh, reduced um, for multiple reasons, and we aren't able to distribute all the plants that we grew this year. So they're actually in the nursery um, waiting for grant funding, but we don't have the funding to, to distribute them. So if you're interested in helping us out with that, there's a really easy way to do that. Just donate a few dollars to Monarch Watch. You can even designate it, designate it to our, our milkweed program. Or you can, um, you can put it in honorarium or memoriam to someone if you'd like. This is one of the greenhouses that we use to grow our plants. Um, we grow hundreds of thousands of plants each year for distribution. You can buy them at the milkweed market on our website, or you can apply for free plants if you have a school or nonprofit organization that has a public garden space. Um, or if you are a landowner that has more than two acres, um, that's, the, that's where actually most of our funding was cut this year. So um, we are looking for people to donate money so that we can continue to get those plants out to people. The milkweed is going all over the place. So we have milkweed going to schools and nonprofits. That's the grant that I actually um, administer, but we also have, just this wide range of places where milkweed is growing, going, and we have cities that are signing the Mayor's Monarch Pledge and um, all kinds of different places. So just, you know, think about, uh, you know, if you wanted to donate money to Monarch Watch, we would be able to get money in, in some of these, put, put, we would put, use it to put plants in the ground is what we would do. So I am gonna. This is just an example of one of the schools that received our plants. We, you know, like I said, we have a grower in California. Um, I'm having trouble with my slides. Here we go. The kids are actually getting their hands in the dirt and planting these plants themselves. It's pretty amazing. They're getting involved. They're having good experiences with monarch butterflies. Some of them are doing our tagging program. Some of them are doing their own citizen science. And some of them have Monarch Way Stations. That is the sign that you would get if you decided that you wanted a Monarch Way Station sign in your garden. 
So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the plants that we have in our garden are food for a lot of other things. And we try our best to establish plantings in our garden that will support more than just monarch butterflies. So I'm going to go through this slide, uh, these slides of these beautiful butterflies that we have actually been feeding in our garden and have photographed in our garden. And then I will have time for questions. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a viceroy butterfly that is a mimic of the monarch. I'm going to go back to that monarch butterfly. It's a little tattered, that one there might even be one of those early migrants coming up from Mexico. That's what they often look like. And we're going to start seeing maybe some of those in Kansas coming up from Mexico looking pretty worn out um, pretty soon. So that's the viceroy. And the big difference between the monarch and the viceroy butterfly is that line on the on the floor. And I'm going to use my arrow. I hope you can see this. There's a line right here. The monarch does not have that. Viceroy's wings are a little bit more angular and they also tend to eat different foods. So monarchs love flowers, but viceroys love to eat fruits on the ground. So they'll often be found on the ground rather than up on the, on the flowers. Here's a silver spotted skipper. We have a lot of host plants for that. The painted lady, which often also has large population booms. The red admiral. The variegated fritillary, which I believe eats a type of violet. So those of you who have violets in your backyard, think about the fritillaries. The gold fritillary is a visitor from the south oftentimes. The pipe vine swallowtail I mentioned earlier is toxic and it has mimics. Um, I might have some photographs of the mimics here in a minute. We have pawpaws in our garden, and the zebra swallowtail could not survive without pawpaws. They are a native tree that has a large fruit that grows. It's a, it's a good um, source of food for animals and people if they choose to eat them. And um, they're usually found on riverbanks and in areas where there's a lot of moisture in the soil. This is the black swallowtail the giant swallowtail, the tiger swallowtail, the question mark, which should not be confused with the comma. The question mark and the comma are named for this area on their hind wing that has a silver swoop and dot. That's the question mark. The comma only has this part right here, the swoop. The spring azure and the summer azure look very similar, and I'm not sure which one this one is. They're tiny blue butterflies. Also, the eastern tail blue is a very small blue butterfly. It likes to lay its eggs on clover. Here's a sleepy orange. The pearl crescent, and I believe it eats that aster we had on the, on the screen earlier. Gray hair streaks. There's also a... Um, an olive hair streak that we have in our garden that eats the um, cedar trees. Hackberry butterflies often have big population booms in the summer and they will be flying all over the place where hackberries are found. I believe the cabbage white comes from Europe. Here's the checkered white, a cloudless sulfur which migrates from the south, a buckeye, goat weed leaf wing, the red spotted purple. The red spotted purple overwinters, I believe, as an adult in the winter time. It's, no, it's uh, hunkered down under bark in the, in the forest. Here's a moth, a white line sphinx moth, a cecropia moth. Now this one is a tussock moth, and some people are very frustrated by these because they eat their milkweed plants. And they will go through the entire milkweed plant like an army, and they do something called skeletonizing. And you can see that they, they're avoiding some of those more toxic areas of the plant by only eating the, the tissues between the veins. 
And then who expected this? This is also a milkweed obligate, the unexpected syncyamoth. moth. Syncynia. It's a really tricky word to say. And that, I believe, is all I have for now. So I am ready for questions. And I'm going to go over here to look at the questions. Um, I have an, a, a question about why the total area occupied by the monarch spiked in from 1996 to 1997. Um, I am afraid that I would have to refer to Dr. Chip Taylor for the answer to that question. And um, he may have already blogged about it in his blog. So if you go to monarchwatch.org, there's a button in the top left corner where it says blog, and he may have already answered that question for you. It probably had to do with um, something to do with weather uh, being very, uh, very good for breeding that year. Uh, hello, hello, Lily. Lily is a um, working on her silver award, and she wants to do it with monarchs. She wants to know how can the monarch, can monarch watch help her create a monarch garden in her community. There is a way to get milkweed donated to your project, Lily. If you're able to find a garden that's in a public space, let's say a, um, a garden that's in a library or even a community garden, and you apply for free milkweed through our website. It's at the very top of the page. It says free milkweed right at the top. Click on that and you will be able to apply for free milkweeds. You will have to get a letter from whomever it is that you have uh, agreed to work with on that. So that I would welcome your, um, your application. Thank you very much. Um, so here is someone um, in Pennsylvania. And she is she raises monarch butterflies so that she can protect them from predators. Um, stink bugs like to eat caterpillars. It is very common. If you go to uh, the internet and you Google um, monarch natural enemies, one of the first things you'll see is a picture of a stink stink bug. She also is having um, issues with bacterial problems. The caterpillars are turning black and dying. Um, it sounds like you're trying to keep your, your cages clean. And despite all of the cleaning that you're doing, you're still seeing that happen. What you might try to do is scale back the number of caterpillars that you're raising. Um, it might be that they're just sharing too many of their own germs. Uh, we like to see people raise about 10 a year um, if they're if they're choosing to do so when you get much more than that sometimes you know get up to 50 or some people are raising thousands of monarchs it gets it's just a little bit harder to keep track of what's going on but project monarch health in Georgia might be able to help you out with some of these these is issues project monarch health studies monarch diseases and they are set up to answer questions like that for you um, and you can also help per, uh, participate in sampling monarch butterflies for a specific disease that you may have heard of called OE. They will send you a free test kit if you want to participate in that. Um, is there potential in covering old landfills with prairie vegetation? to serve as large-scale monarch way stations. Uh, yes, actually, in fact, there is a place called Prairie Acre in um, the Kansas City area. If you Google it, it was actually a super fun site. So not only was it an old place where they had um, lots of um, landfill type material, but it was also highly toxic. And they covered that area and used it. Now it is um, covered with with gardens and it's an open space for people to come and learn about. There's kiosks, there are kiosks there, you can read all about it. And so yeah, that um, people are always looking for new ways to create monarch habitat, including um, old landfills. Um, we also look at um, areas that are mowed frequently like churchyards. 
Um, we also have a lot of open space that's mowed in cities. Um, if you approach these areas that you see and, and just suggest to them that that might be something that they, they could do with that property, it will actually decrease their overall costs because it um, if it's brought back to native plants, then they don't have to mow it as much. So um, we're talking about restoring areas to the native ecosystem, and that will actually help bring down the Earth's temperature some in that area. And um, because um, native plants are actually great at um, reducing uh, the carbon in the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. All these things are great ideas. Um, the address of our Monarch Way Station. So Monarch Way Station number one is on West Campus at the University of Kansas. And um, we are, at 2021 Constant Avenue. How do you keep aphids off of your milkweed in the greenhouse? That's a really good question. So we actually have a mixture that we put together. It's if you take one gallon of water, I hope you're writing this down, one gallon of water, one ounce of Dawn dishwashing liquid, one ounce of vinegar, like um, you know, household vinegar, and one ounce of rubbing alcohol, all mixed together, and you use that in. We use a pump sprayer, and we spray that over the the milkweeds. Um, the aphids that you're talking about are called oleander aphids. They're not actually native to the United States. I I think they may have come from your um, from Asia. I'm not entirely certain, but um, they do sometimes diminish the health of milkweed plants. Once you put that on to the plants, you wanna make sure you're not spraying that mixture onto any other beneficial insects because it will kill them as well. But once, you're, once you've applied that and let it sit for a little while, it's a good idea to rinse it off because some of those things that are in that mixture can actually break down the um, waxy cuticle on the plant. So you want to make sure you kind of wash that off so that the plant can continue to regulate its water. So I am going to, let's see, I'm wanting to plant pipe vine in plastic pots to minimize weed whacker damage. Will this cause excess moisture and poor growth? I do know a lot of people who like to grow their pipe vines in a pot. And that actually is beneficial if you don't want it spreading because it can spread around. Um, so you can plant you can plant um, them in a pot. They will cling to things around, so you you know they will want to climb something. So you'll have to move it if, if if you need to weed whack in the area. Let's see. Oh, okay. So we have somebody who has um, black swallowtail caterpillars on their dill. Uh, black swallowtails like to lay their eggs on dill and their caterpillars look a lot like monarch caterpillars. Look for little dots on the lines. The stripes of those caterpillars have dots within them. They will also put out two little um, feelers in their, in their head that have scent glands in them when they're scared and those don't smell too great. Um, is there an organized monarch support approach in Missouri? So um, Monarch Watch is based out of the University of Kansas, and um, we don't really actually have any other partner organizations other than Monarch Joint Venture and a couple of other um, organizations that are, that are large and broad and, and broad reaching. Um, we do participate in, um, in efforts in Missouri. I um, actually went to the um, initial meeting that they had in Missouri to set up their plan when everything kind of went all crazy with monarch butterflies declining, all of the states decided to have meetings and Monarch Watch was there, I was there personally. <clears throat> Are any of your plants brought to Kansas City? Um, we, we do know of other plant sales that are happening in Kansas City. I don't know how the current situation has changed some of those plant sales. 
Um, but we do not bring our plants to Kansas City. <clears throat> Here's a question about bringing monarch eggs and cat caterpillars in to raise. As I mentioned earlier, um, we try to encourage people to do small numbers. I'm going to mute my microphone for just a second because I've got to click. Okay, I just have a tickle. It's not related to any disease, I promise you. Um, so um, what we encourage people to do is when they're raising monarch butterfly caterpillars in uh, captivity is to try their best to expose the monarchs to as many natural con conditions as possible. Because um, monarch but butterflies have a solar compass as well as a magnetic compass. And those compasses might be affected somehow by where they are uh, being raised. They also might be affected by um, the temperatures in your house or other things other factors that aren't natural temp nat temp temperature and light conditions. The more of those natural conditions you can expose them to, the better. That is why um, people are recommending, uh, people are recommending those kinds of things to increase their ability to migrate. So, um, let me tag. Well, if you show us again how to tell the difference between male and female. Let me see if this butterfly here. All right. So this butterfly that is on this little boy's nose is a male. And I can tell it is a male uh, because there is a swollen gland on this vein right here. It's not as obvious on the underside of the wing as it is on the upper side of the wing. If you were to open the wings up, you would be able to see a dot there. Another way to tell is, and you're going to have to Google this because I don't have any pictures, um, is to look at the very tip end of its abdomen. Males have what we call claspers on their abdomen. They're like little hooks like this. And they're on the end of their, they're on the end of their abdomen. They go, I believe they go this way. I'm not sure. And then the females have a notch. So I'm going to try to like the male, the female's abdomen comes down like this. And then there's a notch at, and the males actually use those claspers to attach to the female when they're mating. So if you look for um, pictures, you should be able to figure that out. Um, tussock moths eating chrysalises. Well, um, I, I'm not surprised that the tussock moths are eating chrysal chrysalises. Sometimes monarch butterfly caterpillars will also eat chrysalises. Apparently those chrysalises taste a lot like milkweed. Not surprisingly, they are what they eat. So they're, they're not considered a normal monarch predator. It's more of an incidental thing. Um, they're, they're not seeking out uh, caterpillars or chrysalises to consume, but if they get in the way of that army of um, tussock moths, it, they might they might be in, end up getting eaten. Um, are there plants that bloom later than native plants? Okay, so there is a wide variety of opinion on whether or not plants have an effect on monarch migration. Um, it is the position of Dr. Taylor, and I agree with him, that the plants that you find in your environment are not affecting the migration. What we oftentimes see in our area are those um, vining milkweeds getting eggs laid on them, and we don't know what's going on. There's this, these monarchs are laying eggs on the milkweed and it's, they're supposed to be migrating, right? Um, so the, the migration is happening whether or not the vining milkweed is there or not. Um, 
certainly nothing that is blooming is going to keep them from migrating. Those monarchs actually need nectar plant nectar sources in order to fuel that migration. But some people feel like the milkweed being present in the environment might um, it somehow influence migration. Dr. Taylor doesn't believe so. I also tend to agree that what we're probably seeing are um, it's just a lot of variation in um, there's a lot of variation in in the um, success rates of monarchs being able to get those triggers to migrate, and we're seeing those monarchs getting that are not getting triggered to migrate, and we're assuming that there's something wrong with them. It's actually an ecological and an, an advantage to them to have variation in in the way they respond to their environment. Because if something went wrong and all of them were in the same place at the exact same time, then they would all be wiped out. It's a, kind of a long-winded answer, but um, hopefully that made sense. Um, Well, um, so there, there were two monarch conservationists in Mexico who died. Um, one of them we know was, um, was killed. We were, it's not 100% certain about the other. I'm not going to comment on that because we, we are friends of the people in Mexico and um, we like to keep good relationships with them and not make any presumptions about what's going on there um, or any recommendations about how we should respond to that specific event. I do, um, I do know that what's important is that we continue to support the, migrate, the, the migratory monarchs that end up in Mexico and do that by um, continuing to support tagging program, which actually puts money in the pockets of people in Mexico. Um, if you know of any organizations that are helping to plant trees in Mexico, we can support those. Um, there are some really good conservation efforts happening. We need to continue to support those. Um, and that way um, we can help uh, the memory of the people who died. Um, that's, that's really all I have to say about that. Um, someone is mentioning that they had no luck finding monarchs in Maryland. And thank, thank you for visiting our, our webinar all the way from Maryland. Thank you. Um, there, there were pockets of areas in, in the United States last year where there were a lot of monarch butterflies and people were seeing them all over the place and there were places where people were not seeing them at all. Um, I don't think that's terribly unusual in this day and age, um, but it's really hard to say what kinds of, of things are happening in those small areas where you're not seeing them. Um, I have a question about highway traffic. Is highway traffic dangerous for monarchs? There are studies, there are studies going on right now about highways and, um, and even one in, uh, in Minnesota about road salt and how it's affecting monarch butterflies. Those results are not out yet. Obviously, there are some butterflies that are going to be hit by um, on, oncoming traffic near highways. Um, one of the concerns that people often mention is whether or not we should be planting milkweed near highways. Um, and I think what's important to realize is that no matter where uh, you plant milkweed, they're going to be um, they're going to be things that are going to be at, adversely affect monarch butterflies. Um, the question is how much do uh, cars affect the um, populations near roads? And we can only guess right now. Our guess is that it's better to have some habitat rather than zero habitat. And sometimes we're, we're talking about areas where the, there's um, it's just corn and soy for miles and miles and miles. And the only habitat available is roadside. So um, what are the options? Do we plant milkweed on the roadside or do we not have any at all? I think it gives them a better chance if you, if you have some. Are there monarch friendly plants that can be grown in containers? That's a really good question. Um, there are a lot of people who do not like the idea of planting tropical milkweed because there are some associations of tropical milkweed with the disease, uh, especially in 
the, so the southern parts of the United States and parts of California. So if you live, um, if this person who's asking this question lives in Florida or the Gulf Coast region, probably best to stick with 100% natives. But if you live in an area where you get a hard freeze and you can only container garden, consider planting tropical milkweed and some other flowers, um, annuals that are gonna support um, their, their nectar needs. Let's see, so how big does a monarch waste station have to be to qualify as a designated station? The requirements of a monarch waste station have nothing to do with size and more to do with what is it that you are supplying to monarchs. So if you have a couple of different species of milkweed and you have nectar sources available to them, it can be any size. Um, unfortunately, there's no way for us to regulate what people are, are actually registering as a monarch waste station. So if you, um, if you, for some reason, were crazy and you wanted to register a cinder block as a monarch waste station, you could probably do that. Um, but the only benefit would be that we would get the money that you spent on the registration fee. But um, literally, what we want is for people to do their best to grow some plants that are going to supply nectar and food sources for monarch caterpillars and if that's all you can do, that's that's better than nothing. If you had um, only mowed grass before and now you have five milkweeds and several asters and some sunflowers and that is all, you can still register that. Um, let's see, so I have a question about wasps that will kill caterpillars. Um, there are, I believe it is yellow jackets, I'm not going to, don't quote me on that, but there are some wasps that do kill monarch caterpillars as, as well as um, other types of butterfly and moth caterpillars. Um, a lot of these wasps uh, are able to smell the frass or that is the poop of the caterpillars and they find their prey based on smelling that. So if you're raising monarch butterflies and you, a lot of that uh, frass is being collected in the bottom of the container and you're not cleaning it out, that might increase the um, ability of these wasps to find them. Uh, how many square feet of garden are needed to plant? Let's see. Um, as I mentioned, if you have zero square feet of garden, you cannot feed any monarch butterflies. There isn't a minimum. We try to encourage people to have a 100 square foot garden. So that's a 10 by, by 10 garden, it's not terribly large. So that, that's what our, our minimum recommendation is, but anything that you do is better than nothing. Oh, I just have a, a shout out to the Missouri Prairie Foundation. You guys are amazing. Um, we love you and keep up the good work. The Missouri Prairie Foundation is another organization that's worth um, putting your effort in, and um, time into uh, researching. And they do a lot of preservation and maintenance of prairies. Thank you very much. Um, is it necessary to purchase tropical, organic, toxin-free milkweed plants only? So, um, this is a really interesting question. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question that you're asking, but um, when you're buying plants for monarch butterflies or anything that you're buying that you know is a host plant of any other organism, it's really important to, to try your best to figure out if those plants have been treated with a, um, a pesticide that is in the plant tissues. Um, all of the plants that we grow in our greenhouse have not been treated with um, systemic pesticides. Those are, those are um, specifically insecticides that are supposed to get into the plant system and affect everything that eats the plant. That would include monarch butterflies. So it's really important to try to avoid um, buying plants that don't have uh, those pesticides. They do not have to be organically grown. Um, so that, I hope, answers your question. Um, so I've got a question to uh, clarify. 
why migrating monarchs are different butterflies than non-migrators. So when I say different, I'm just, uh, what, I'm, what I'm really trying to say is that they are juvenile. The migratory butterflies are like little kids that haven't developed any um, sex characteristics yet. So um, that actually allows them to live longer. Uh, they're not, they're not going to be putting energy into growing um, uh, eggs or sperm or putting energy into trying to mate with other, other butterflies. So because they're able to conserve that energy, they're putting it into fat stores. Their metabolic systems are different from those that are using energy very quickly to continually look for a mate and reproduce. So that's how they're really different. I have a question about um, how monarch butterflies fly. Um, they do a lot of coasting and they use um, a lot like you'll see birds. Um, using drafts in the wind, they use uh, wind currents to catch those wind currents and fly. That's how they end up flying, I think, um, around 30 to 60 miles a day. And I ha it, it looks like it's about 104. I don't know how many more questions we have. We have 10 more questions. How are we doing on time? Eric, what do you think? Um, 2020 tagging season. Um, we will not be adding any extra questions about whether or not monarchs are raised indoors or outdoors. We're still going to keep it pretty simple for people. If you would like to include that information, um, you can include that separately. We will always take extra information about um, monarch sizes or other observations that you're making but the uh, official tagging data sheet needs to be simple and uh, honed down to those things that we're asking for specifically. Mm. All right, Angie, we can take yeah. one more question and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna skim these real quick. And it sounds like we have a question about um, what kinds of, uh, should we have more than one type of milkweed? And the answer to that is it's always helpful to have more than one kind. Our Monarch Way Station recommendation is to have two or more. Um, sometimes it's difficult to find more than one kind of milkweed to put in your garden. Um, but the reason for that is that um, not all milkweed species are actively growing at the same time. So if you have an early migration one year and you've got the uh, plant that comes up sooner, then you'll be able to feed that monarch um, butterfly the, well, you'll be, they'll be able to lay eggs. Um, but if you have a plant that comes up later, you won't have that available. So, it, you know, and they bloom at different times as well. So it's good to have a, a variety. Diversity is really the key to productivity in any ecosystem and that Go, goes all the way down to the level of what kinds of foods things are eating. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to hand it over to our moderator. Thank you, Angie. I, I'm having trouble getting my video restarted, but I just want to give a give you a thank you for uh, just a wonderful presentation today. You're welcome. Uh, my video's back. So there you are. Again, thank you, and, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for our program. Uh, Andy, there, there were a few questions that uh, we, we didn't have time to get to today. Is there somewhere they can go to uh, get those questions answered? If you need to uh, have questions answered by me, and I can always take emails at monarch at ku.edu. That's just the name of the butterfly at KU, which is kansasuniversity.edu. And I know we had a couple of people ask about uh, links to the video. Uh, the video uh, from today's presentation will be immediately available on the library's Facebook page. If you're not Eric, you've frozen up.
Yeah, I think we're having some technical difficulties there with Eric. Um, this is Ashley. I'm the Not program coordinator. Wait a day or two. <laughs> we'll get this. Uh, we'll get this sorted out here. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, but we we will have, as Eric was saying, the video available immediately on the Linda Hall Library Facebook page. If you want to revisit, I know a lot of people are wanting to write down that aphid killer recipe. Uh, I am writing it down myself. And then we'll also share the video on the Linda Hall Library website at lindahall.org. Eric, I think you're live again, if you'd like to wrap up. Okay, yeah. Thank you again, Angie, and thank you to everyone. And we hope to see you uh, soon at a future program. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.